All right, everybody, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Apologies for the late start. We had a little bit of technical difficulties, but we're ready to get started now. And I'll get my presentation ready. I do have a colleague here, Nathan Gutierrez, who's going to be helping us monitor our question and answer period. So for those who've joined us tonight, we'll do a presentation first. It'll take maybe 20 to 30 minutes and the rest of the time will be allotted to public comment and questions. And that will be our virtual component tonight. So without further ado, let me go ahead and get started on our presentation. So tonight, this is the City of Bakersfield Ward Redistricting and Communities of Interest presentation. A little bit of housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on the city's ward redistricting website. So I have the ward redistricting website listed here. Almost all of this information is available online and has been available for the past week. We were, this was the technical difficulty we had, unfortunately, we are not able to, we are not able to have our Spanish translation tonight. So unfortunately, we won't be able to provide that tonight on this webinar, but we will make sure that we have these materials translated at a future date. Also, we have live closed captioning available that should be turned on now. So if it is not, you can check your settings that will be available to you. Some additional housekeeping, like we mentioned, you can submit your questions into the question and answer box. We'll take those questions after the end of the presentation tonight, and then we will also allow time for any comments, especially if you would like to make a question uh, verbally. Uh, you can raise your hand at that time and we'll take time for verbal questions as well. So the things that we're going to cover tonight, some basic redistricting principles as well as traditional redistricting principles. And really what we're trying to get out of tonight is some feedback on communities of interest within the city of Bakersfield. And those communities of interest will really help inform our draft map making and the process from here on out. I also wanna go over the website to make sure that you know where to look so that the uh, materials that you see during this presentation tonight can uh, be found online. And then of course, we'll take our public testimony towards the end of the meeting and then go through the schedule for the remainder of the process. So to level set here, this is currently the city of Bakersfield ward map. So if you see all of the color blocked areas, that is the city of Bakersfield. The areas outside of those colored blocks um, are actually part of the county of Kern or our county islands. So just orient yourself a little bit here, starting with Ward 1 and going uh, counterclockwise. Ward 1 is represented by Councilmember Eric Arias. Ward 2 represented by Councilmember Andre Gonzalez. Ward 3 represented by Vice Mayor Ken Weir. Ward 4, Councilmember Bob Smith. Ward 5, Councilmember Bruce Freeman. Ward 6, Councilmember Patty Gray. And Ward 7, Councilmember Chris Parlier. So this is currently where our city of Bakersfield wards stand. And as you'll see in a little bit, there will be some changes to this map coming. So we'll go into some of the basics right now. Uh, what is redistricting? Redistricting is the process of adjusting ward lines every 10 years after the release of the US Census. The well-known examples are congressional and state legislative districts, but local governments also must do redistricting. So beyond creating districts of equal population, redistricting also serves to empower local communities and to preserve voting rights. So tradition, traditional redistricting principles, things that you must keep in mind to prevent a district from becoming a gerrymander. So the city will have rules to follow when drafting maps. The list that you see right here is in order of importance and we'll have to follow these traditional principles um, to help prevent that gerrymander. First one is relatively equal in size, meaning that we do our representation based on people, not citizens. Uh, contiguous, meaning that wards should not hop or jump. They must, uh, for example, if you were to draw a line with pencil, you should not lift your pencil to make sure that your wards are connecting. You should maintain communities of interest, and that is part of the Fair Maps Act and what we'll be going into a little more in depth later tonight. Follow city, county, and local government lines and keep wards compact, both in appearance and in function. Another item we wanna keep in mind when we're looking at our current redistricting data is how far are each ward 
is each ward deviating from the ideal average? So deviation from an average population for each ward is acceptable if reasonably based upon certain criteria. Case law has established that a deviation of zero to 5% is construed as very reasonable. A deviation of up to 10% can occur without formal justification. A deviation of 10% to 16.4% can occur only with formal justification based on established criteria. And a deviation above 16.4% is intolerable. A little bit more about our process and the remaining process um, leading up to map adoption. Council shall invite the public to at least four public hearings, at least one hearing before the council draws a draft map of proposed boundaries, at least two hearings after council draws a draft map of proposed boundaries, and at least one hearing or workshop shall be held on a Saturday, Sunday, or on a weekday after 6 o'clock p.m. So this schedule that you see before you is going to be really important for the remainder of our process. Our first public hearing on the redistricting process was held in August of this year uh, during a city council meeting. We have tonight's meeting, which is a staff led workshop virtually here on Zoom. And the following meetings in January, Wednesday, January 19th will be the second public hearing. And this will be an item on the city council agenda. The location for all of the remaining meetings will be at the city council chambers here in downtown Bakersfield. And I have bolded the date for Wednesday, February 23rd, because for that particular city council meeting, the item of redistricting will be the main, if not the only item that city council will consider that evening. So we will have really robust discussion um, come February 23rd. And you'll also see in the item column there that we are expecting to have draft maps by early new year. So tentatively, we're aiming to have that first iteration of draft maps available to the public in January. So it's really important that we get our community of interest feedback so we can help inform that process. We'll have time between the January and February meetings to make revisions and edits, and as well as have additional commentary, especially at that Wednesday, February 23rd meeting. And that will be our third public hearing. Uh, come March, we'll have a fourth public hearing and Wednesday, April 6th, uh, that will be the final vote. Keeping in mind that our redistricting maps will have to go through an ordinance approval. So on March 16th, we will have the first reading of that or ordinance at the city council meeting. And then April 6th will be the second reading and final adoption of the maps for the city of Bakersfield. So participation, council shall in good faith uh, make an effort to do the following, providing information to media organizations, including to minority communities, providing live translations at hearings or workshops pursuant to translation request, publish date, time, and location of public hearing at least five days prior, publish draft map at least seven days before adoption, and record and prepare written summaries of draft map comments and maintain our website for 10 years. Now this information I'm gonna go over now is available on our website as well. And the website for the redistricting process on the city's website is housed under the city clerk department. So if you've had any trouble finding that website or if, for any reason, the link has not been working, we had one comment on that so far, um, you can find that by going to departments and under city clerk and ward redistricting. And you'll find all of this information there. So. As far as where the city stands currently, based on 2020 census data and on state redistricting data. I remember the difference between those two is that the state redistricting data is the final data that the city will use to determine equal population among the wards. And that data, of course, came from reallocated inmate population. So for the city of Bakersfield, the difference in population between, between 2010 and 2020 is about an additional 56,000 people. So the city of Bakersfield is definitely growing. We experienced a growth rate of about 16%, um, very high above the California average. So that I think just speaks to the desire to make a city of Bakersfield your home, which is great for us. And we've also hit that 400,000 threshold well past it, especially with our state redistricting data. So by ward, you can see the changes for each ward by population. And 
This next chart here is also in this memo available online, and this shows the current deviation of all seven wards based on our redistricting data. Now, if you think back to the deviation slide where you think about you know, what is an acceptable level of deviation, the city of Bakersfield is currently at a deviation of 17.2%. Two of the large outliers of our city wards are wards two and wards three. And so because those two wards have such a disparate amount of population, um, our deviation is pulled at to a very high amount. So we will likely, this is not um, set in stone, we have nothing drafted, but we will likely see some changes to those uh, ward boundaries to make sure that we can strive for that more average population. And that absolute average you'll see here at the top would be of a population of about 58,000. For example, if you take a look at the row for Ward 7, Ward 7 is very, very well within, um, almost perfect, the amount of people who are currently uh, residing there. So I'll take a look at redistricting status as far as a voting age population. So this is also in the memo online. And this is important to make sure that you can see which um, ethnicities, which races are protected under the Voting Rights Act. So I'm going to actually refer to the memo that is available online. And that is this memo here. So if you've had the opportunity, you can find this memo from our, our consultant redistricting partners on our website. And I just wanted to walk through each of the wards um, by their voting age population as well. So the memo begins with some of the same summary information I shared with you uh, now. And we're gonna head down to looking at these wards by their citizen voting age population. So this is um, pretty inter interesting information for the city to know and for our residents as well. If you're taking a look at wards one, which is typically you know, that southeast part of the city, as far as 2020 census data, uh, there's a 78% Latino population. Of that, of the voting age population, that voting age population is about 58%. Take a look at ward two. Ward two, that voting age population for Latinos would be about 40%. You can also see other ethnicities that are protected under the Voting Rights Act. And I'll pause for just a second too to also clarify that this other column is pretty large. Um, and I can double check this with our consultant as well, but this other column is um, other ethnicities that fall outside of these three, which would be white, Caucasian, or uh, American Indian. Um, and that's what you see in these other columns. We'll take a look at Ward 3. So Ward 3 is a... We also have Ward 4. Ward 5. Ward six. And Ward seven. One of the reasons we wanted to walk through and take give you a look at each ward by its boundaries and by its data is that one will also have this data available when any draft maps are proposed but also to kind of take a look at what we have as far as minority majority districts, or in our case, we use district and ward interchangeably. So Ward 7 has a 54% Latino population. Ward 7 would be considered a minority majority district, as well as Ward 1 for having that percentage over 50%. So we'll keep that in mind as we move forward in this process. But this is where the city currently stands. Now remember, going back to our, some of our deviations, uh, Ward 3 has the highest population currently uh, and is one of the wards that may need to see some change as well as Ward 2 as the population is well below the average that we have set out so far. So, 
we'll head back to our presentation here. And I wanted to start the presentation now with um, introducing communities of interest and why we are asking for members of the public to submit their feedback and then also presenting to you the different ways that you can do that. So there's a number of criteria maintaining these communities of interest. So communities of interest, they're like the building blocks of districts. A community of interest includes ethnic and language minorities and other groups. They are subjective and open-ended to be as inclusive as possible. So some advice that I've been given is if you think you have an argument for a community of interest, you're probably right if you can make that argument. There are some exceptions, um, but the exceptions are few. So communities that are covered by the Voting Rights Act are uh, Latinos, Asians, and African Americans. So again, that's why you see some of their data um, split out in some of our memos so far. It says, while communities of interest may include race, it cannot be the predominant factor in drawing district boundaries. And then what you see here is a list of what could be potential communities of interest within our community. So historical communities, economic interests, racial composition. I just wanna kind of pause here and for those participants who are here with us tonight, try and see if you have an, or are a part of any of these potential communities of interest. Um, you know, think about where they're geographically might be located. And is there a city council issue that the city council may act on that would impact your community of interest? It's also very important to go through what is not a community of interest. So the Fair Maps Act explicitly prohibits these groups from being considered as communities of interest, and that's political party affiliation, um, incumbents sitting on the city council, and political candidates. And it's also hard in redistricting to truly, truly utilize um, groups of similarly minded people who do not share a similar geographic location or are citywide. So if there's something, um, that is a little bit too dispersed throughout the city and you really can't map it, we probably would not consider that community of interest. These three critical questions um, will help you define your community of interest. Does the community have a shared culture, characteristics, or bond? And, you know, powerful story or personal stories are really powerful. You know, do you know of community members who would be willing to share examples of things that them or their neighbors share in common and make their community unique. So imagine describing your community to someone who wants to move to, to your community. Does your neighborhood share certain celebrations or traditions? Are there important places where a community gathers? What is the history of how your community came together? So those are some things to think about. Is the community geographic in nature? Is the community able to be mapped? And the third one down here, Describe the community's relationship with the jurisdiction and how it is affected by the policy decisions made by the elected officials. We'll go through a couple of examples here also. Um, so examples of communities of interest, a group of renters who live downtown testifies to the city council. Would this be considered a community of interest? Kind of think to yourself for but a moment. Yes. This group of residents can easily be mapped in a distinct area and they share a common policy interest, which can be addressed through legislation or public services. Next example, a part of town that has a historic nature, either as a former hub of business community or as an area that had been discriminated against through redlining or racially restrictive covenants. Should the city prioritize this historical area when drawing their maps? Yes, historical communities and areas with historic discrimination can and should be recognized as a community of interest when drawing maps. Last example for tonight, a statewide group for people who are fans of the San Francisco Giants testifies to the city council on redistricting. Is this a community of interest? Oh, some people may say yes, but unfortunately, no. It is important that a community of interest is distinct enough to draw on a map. This group overlaps throughout the entire state. It's unlikely that a governing agency has any say over these issues. 
that kind of gives you an idea if this interest is shared too broadly and really can't be mapped or is not applicable to the business of city council, then we can probably rule those out. I did also want to, again, point your direction over, or point your attention over to the city's redistricting website. And our website will have this presentation, this recording, as well as any future recordings and agendas throughout the process. Now, the quickest way that I have found to make sure that you can find uh, the redistricting website is to go to departments and then under city clerk, you will see ward redistricting. So this is our redistricting website. This is a website we will have maintained on our city website for 10 years. And where I really want to point your attention tonight and for members of the public to submit your feedback is the middle of the website here, submitting your community inter of interest or proposed maps. We have available uh, resources, both in English and in Spanish. So we have a community of interest form, looks like this. You can also scan this form on this QR code here if it is easier for you to submit online. So we have multiple ways that you can submit this. This is a fillable form. You can fill this out, save it, and send it to the redistricting email, which is also listed on our website right here. The online form is just another tool. You can choose if you can would like to take this in English or in Spanish. Also important on this website is the PDF tool that we have for printing out your mapping tool. Now this mapping tool can also be used to do proposed word boundaries as well. And we'll get into this tool a little bit more later on as well. You'll also find a similar schedule to the one that is part of this presentation, showing you when the upcoming meetings are here as well as in the top. And especially important too, I'd like to draw your attention to the redistricting email over at the side of the web, the web page. If you would like to get updates on the redistricting process, we need you to opt into those updates by emailing redistricting at bakersfieldcity.us. And I will be the one who um, has access to that email, can answer your questions, and will be able to take your feedback. Even if one of these um, methods don't work for you, just reach out. I am available as a staff person to come and speak to your group. I'm definitely available um, by phone. We can set an appointment, especially if you have um, more specific questions about the redistricting process. Great. So again, just putting out that call that I would really like for members of our public to go onto our website either print out or use the online community of interest forms. And you can provide this either to the email, you can provide this in person, there are instructions even if you'd like to mail it in, those are all great options. That mapping template that we showed is available for printing on the city's website, right here. And what this website or what this map shows you, just to kind of give you a quick rundown, is it shows you some templates of census blocks here. Now these numbers have been rounded out for the purposes of this map drawing, but they are based on census data and for the sake of just trying to make this map drawing a little easier on our participants. So what you would do is print this out. If you wanted to draw your community of interest on there, you could do that. You could do something as easy as taking a picture of that, sending it into our email, and that will count. It is optional whether or not you want to leave your contact information, but if you do leave your contact information, we'll likely reach out to you if we have any questions on your community of interest. Additionally, please also title your maps so that we know which community of interest this is protecting. And you can also use this map to propose ward boundaries, and that's what these lines at the bottom are. So if you have some ideas on ways that you can still apply those traditional redistricting principles we went over in the beginning of the presentation, you can add together these census block population numbers and assign them per ward, remembering that the ideal ward absolute average would be about 58,000. So wanted to bring your attention one last time to the remaining public hearings for the city's redistricting process. Again, these hearings will take place during city council meetings in the city council chambers here in downtown Bakersfield. 
the Wednesday, February 23rd, 2022 meeting, redistricting will be the only, if not the main, then the only item that is on the city council agenda for that evening. So we'll have extended periods of time to make sure that there's um, a lot of time for discussion for the maps at that point. Also remember that we are tentatively poised to have our draft maps in January. So please try and reach out to your groups, reach out to your networks and have them get their community of interest input in very soon so that we can have that input considered in these draft maps. That does not mean that that's the deadline for input. We will accept input on communities of interest and proposed maps throughout the entirety of the process. We want to make sure that we get in as much as we can early so that we can make any revisions that uh, city council had gives us direction to once they have an opportunity to see the maps. Yep. All right. So we're going to go into uh, questions and testimony time. So we welcome your questions and comments. Uh, you can raise your hand if you would like to ask a question or make a comment verbally. Please try and make sure that your comments are focused on the topic at hand and we'll, we'll do our best to uh, provide you an answer. Lisa, your line is open. I had a question about the times that are, I didn't see any times listed on some of those hearings coming up in the new year. Are they all to be held at 6 p.m.? Hi there, thank you for that question. Yes, so we currently have this February 23rd meeting set at 6 o'clock p.m., likely because that is going to be the only item on that agenda. For the other meetings, our city council meetings start at 5.15 p.m. It is probable that we are going to have our redistricting item scheduled for 6 o'clock p.m. also. Um, when you have a redistricting item on a regular city council agenda, the rule is a little bit different. You can still continue your item that is on the agenda. You can complete that business prior to starting your hearing. So. Six o'clock is likely the time that will be posted on here. And there are public noticing requirements as far as posting the times for these. Well, we have posted here our dates for you. So please do save those dates. All of these meetings will take place in the evening. Um, actually, the Fair Maps Act requires that even when the redistricting hearing is held within an agendized meeting, the time set for that redistricting hearing, once it is set, you must stop whatever other agenda, agendized items you are in the middle of and start the hearing at the, the time that you have told the public you're going to have the redistricting hearing. I also have our consultants from redistricting partners on the line. Liz, uh, will you go ahead and unmute yourself and see if you can address that question? Absolutely. Yeah, so, and just uh, to reiterate uh, what you just said, Lori, um, the redistricting part of the agenda is time certain. And that is, you're right, that is, under the Fair Maps Act. Um, so once it is on the agenda for a certain time, it is guaranteed to be at that time, um, you know, give or take a few minutes. It's okay if they wrap up something, but it really should be as close to the time it says it's going to start. Thank you, Liz. Um, and if it's okay with you, I would like to make one more correction. Um, so under the slides that say uh, the deviation allowance, I just want to reiterate that the Supreme Court um, has determined that anything uh, up to 10% or less will be considered constitutional unless proven otherwise. Um, but anything above that, um, we really shouldn't be looking at um, anything higher than 10%. It does risk being deemed unconstitutional. 
Um, so any map that we create will be under 10% deviation. So I just wanna make that quick correction and uh, happy to take any more questions. Thank you, Liz, for adding that additional context. Yes, this is a slide that we had in our um, initial introduction as well. Uh, we don't have that particular case noted as far as 10% being accepted. And I would also echo your sentiments that we would not be looking at a deviation above 10%. These are just kind of trying to illustrate that anything above that is intolerable. We do know what our current deviation is. So it gives us kind of an idea of how far we need to go to get under that 10%. So appreciate that. I had a question here that says, will community of interest input accepted tonight? Yes, that is what we are here for. If you would like to raise your hand and make a comment verbally, you can do that. You can also submit your input in the question and answer box and we'll make sure that that is acknowledged as well. Yes, I think we have um, Councilmember Patty Gray. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I apologize. Did you hear my question? I think I was muted. No, I'm uh, sorry, we didn't. Please repeat that. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to confirm that Ward 6 is under that 5% uh, deviation. Is that correct? I will go back to that slide and double check and see what deviation Ward 6 is at. Okay. Yeah, Ward 6 is under a 5% uh, deviation, and that's, you know, the population that deviates from the average. It's currently at 3.8%. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Mm And I'm pulling up the communities of interest slide here just to try and um, you know, ask some questions that might help us think about some communities that we can think of. Or maybe you have some partners in mind who may have a community of interest that they represent. So this would be a good time to just kind of think about who in your network may be able to submit community of interest feedback. So again, does the community have a shared culture, characteristics, or bond? Is the community geographic in nature? Is the community able to be mapped? Describe the community's relationship with the jurisdiction and how it is affected by the policy decisions made by the elected officials. Okay, we have a question from Ms. Lori Passante. I would like to provide some community of interest input. Um, it is my request of this council that the Voting Rights Act districts be drawn first um, per the Fair Maps Act prioritization hierarchy and that the Voting Rights Act districts um, once drawn, they take into account, especially the community of interest of our Punjabi community in the Southwest I would like to request that heat maps be used to identify um, where folks of Asian descent are living and to ensure that they are in the same in the same district together. I would like also for after the VRA districts uh, to be drawn for there to be a recognition of West Bakersfield um, affluent communities as a community of interest with shared interests. I live in this area and I wish to be recognized and acknowledged as a community of interest. And um, the, similarly, I would like um, to be recognized the city in the hills areas of um, in the eastern side of the city to be recognized as a community of interest to be kept whole within one district. 
and um, likewise the northwest portion of the city to be kept whole in one district. Finally, I would like our criminal justice system impacted populations to be considered a community of interest, um, especially as relates to those areas in the city where there are verified racially restrictive covenants and a history of redlining, for example, in the central district adjacent to um, Owens and along Brundage, East California, and the so-called two square miles, which has been identified as a, a, a location of significance for our criminal justice work. And I appreciate your consideration of those communities of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pisante. I've written down notes of those communities of interest. And I just want to also note, I, for those who are able to give comments tonight, if you are open to it and available, if we do have further questions um, to follow up on some of your community of interest, or if you'd like to share a little bit more about them as well, um, just let you know, we'll likely reach out to get, to get additional detail and keep that discussion going. I really appreciate your input. Okay, we don't currently have any requests to speak or any questions in our queue. One of the items that I'll go over um, in the meantime, I still wanna give people who are present tonight some chance to think um, and definitely know that this is not the only opportunity to provide community of interest feedback. Any feedback that we receive by email, through our forms, by surveys will be considered. So just keep this in mind as you start to develop that feedback. One of the items I did want to go over um, that may be helpful for community members is, um, you know, really how to stay involved and knowing that we have the remainder of our communities, um, or at least our public hearings taking place at city council or at city council meetings. So this is just a little bit of good to know for when you're coming to those meetings to make a comment, um, attending your city um, council public hearing. If you'd like for your feedback to be included into the public record for a specific meeting, it is really helpful to have that either in writing or leaving a message to the city clerk's office by one o'clock on the day of the meeting. Now that doesn't mean that it won't be included in um, public record. We will collect all of that data and make sure it is communicated to our both our consultant who is doing our demographics for us and to city council, but it's helpful for business of the meeting that day to have it by one o'clock PM. So you can send um, additional comments to redistricting at bakersfieldcity.us if that is easier for you. If you are able to make it to a city council public hearing in person, um, the process to do that is when you walk into the city council chambers, and again, that's downtown here, 1501, Truxton Avenue, <clears throat> across the street from City Hall North and next to the police station. Um, you'll walk in, the city council chambers are right in front of you and there will be speaker cards as soon as you walk into the chambers themselves. You'll take that speaker card, um, write down your name and make sure that you also write down what item you are commenting on. So if you're commenting on redistricting or you'd like to put input us uh, or at least say your input during the meeting, make sure you indicate that on your card, bring your speaker card down to the city clerk so she will be sitting in the middle of the room in the dais. And it's helpful to have that into the city clerk before the start of um, the business. Our city council meetings begin at 5, 15 p.m., give or take a few minutes, depending on you know, the course of things for that night. And then public comments will be time limited during this time. It's up to the discretion and the policies of council. If you do have extended comments um, beyond your time limit um, given verbally during the meeting, you can submit those in writing or you can also submit them in other ways that we have um, described here as well. But that is another way to make sure that you can come and um, share, your, share your comments verbally. And I'll pause there because it does look like we have a question that's come up.
I think you have a raised hand here from Matthew Martin. Please go ahead. Hi, my question is, uh, will there be a interactive map that uh, individuals can you know, draw the lines themselves and see where that lies with the census data? Hi there, Matthew. Thank you for the question. We currently do not have uh, an interactive online map available. What we do have is the PDF version of the map. So we'll be accepting um, that map as a tool. And if you have any other um, you know, written testimony that you'd like to submit as a potential ward map, we can accept that as well. But we do not currently have an interactive tool, no. Okay, and, and secondly, Will this uh, slideshow presentation be available online? Yes, it will. This presentation will be available at that same um, website that I showed you in the table towards the middle of the page. Perfect, thank you. And sorry, just one more point. Um, and before you post that online, can we make sure we get the deviation corrected? Yep, we can, we'll definitely make sure we have that in there when we post this online. Thank you. Great, we have a TDH Associates, go ahead. Hi, Troy, I don't know if you are unmuted or if you're um, giving your testimony right now, but we actually can't hear you. You do have the permissions to speak, so we'll give you another minute or so here to uh, get situated. And for those who are also on the line with us, uh, we'll make sure that we are on this uh, live webinar a while longer in case you have some verbal testimony to give. Okay, I don't know if um, TDH Associates was, uh, oh no, I'm, looks like we had to um, put his hand down there. Apologize if you weren't able to unmute there, you um, have to also unmute on your end uh, once you have that ability to speak, but you can also submit your comments to the question and answer box as well.
All right, so we've uh, opened the floor here, but it looks like um, our attendance is waning a little bit. So I wanted to put up this last slide here um, to make sure that you are, are staying involved with the city's redistricting process. You can join our email list by emailing redistricting at bakersfieldcity.us, and we can make sure that we include you on any updates that we send out. You can also request a staff presentation or meeting to your group. So if you have some community organizations you think would benefit from learning a bit more about the city's process in particular, uh, staff can definitely be available to meet with you. Please also make sure you are submitting a community of interest map or form online. Also encourage your network to do so. And that also goes for proposed ward boundaries. And one more thing I wanted to address also, I really wanted to thank our um, consultant partner for their content. And also to clarify as well that our redistricting partners, they are helping us with a lot of templates for our presentations. Um, though some of the content on our presentations um, is generated by the city of Bakersfield. So they are helping us with some templates, but mainly redistricting partners is on board to help us with our demographic data. And they are the experts in that, and that is what we have hired them to do. So appreciate you, Liz, for uh, being online tonight as well. Thanks. Yeah, happy to be here. Okay, we are going to stay online, but if um, any of our participants who are online right now do not have any further comments to give, um, we will just make sure that we are online a little while longer in case anybody joins late and wanted to give testimony. But if you have received your information for the evening, um, you can consider yourself free to excuse yourself um, and have the rest of your evening for what you need. Please know that we will be available as staff to answer questions at any time, not just during these public hearings. So if you are um, do not have any more questions for us tonight, we'll hang on, but you are free to um, exit the meeting. I'm going to do a quick check-in because we did have um, an attendee join just to let you know that 
We have reached the end of the presentation portion of the workshop tonight. Um, what we have currently going is an open floor to provide input on your potential community of interest. So if you have joined a little bit late, I will go ahead and pull up a slide that may be helpful for you. Uh, you can submit your community of interest either online on the city's website uh, by going to the city clerk department and then ward redistricting. You can also give testimony tonight if you're comfortable doing that. You can do that by raising your hand. Uh, we can give you permission to speak. And you can also type your testimony into our question and answer box. And hi there, I think we had our hand up from um, Troy Hightower. Yes, good evening. Um, I was on the phone, but the um, system didn't work right. So I, um, I it wasn't able to unmute. But my question is, um, what, what is the difference or the significance between a hearing and, and the other meetings like this one as far as the process goes? Hi, thank you. And I, I can provide a little bit of context, but I'm actually going to ask that Liz, if she can provide um, based on her experience working with other cities. So this workshop is staff led. Um, we do not have a quorum of council members. This is not quite the same level of noticing as we would for a city council meeting. Um, you can have uh, one or more uh, staff led workshops that can be in place of a public hearing. We're not doing that in our process. We will have public hearings at city council um, at the required amount that we need. So I'll pause there. And if Liz, if you have any other insight, you can share on that question. Yeah, it's also required under the Fair Maps Act um, that there be a certain amount of hearings. So the public will have an opportunity to provide input at a hearing. Um, and usually that's a city council meeting. Um, so before the maps come out and then there will be two hearings after the maps come out for the public to um, provide input and then one additional hearing depending on um, where the city uh, wants to put it so either before or after the maps are released. Um, so uh, there are new regulations under the Fair Maps Act that require the city to have opportunities for the public to uh, remain engaged in the process before and after the maps are published. Um, thank, thank you for, for clearing that up. I understand about the requirement for the hearings, but I'm not sure about these other meetings and what, what is this something that the public should attend those as well, like this workshop? Is there gonna be other staff workshops? I will add um, that these are usually the best time uh, for the public to ask questions and um, begin engaging in this process. So um, typically other cities do have these kind of uh, public engagement seminars and it does count as one of the meetings for the Fair Maps Act. Um, but that being said, it's not a requirement um, and um, I, I'll leave it uh, up to city staff to um, answer if there will be any additional one of these meetings. Well, I, I appreciate your response because I suspected that that's what this was because this was informative mm -hmm. where the hearings, I've been in other hearings on redistricting. And I think these staff level or these type workshops will be really helpful for the public. In, in addition to the hearings. Great, and thank you for your input. It's it's good to know that uh, the public, you know, wants to engage and finds this uh, helpful. So that's really important for us to hear. Thank you. Thank you, and I wanted to echo that appreciation, Troy. Um, 
for the informative side of this as well. I do know, um, you know, when we are starting to introduce our draft maps, there will be presentations at city council meetings as well so that the council members uh, can get level set on that information as well as the public who are in attendance. So that's great feedback. I did have a question come in and that was just um, once again that this meeting is being recorded and that you can go to the city's re ward redistricting website and I'll just show um, really quickly the quickest way to get there is going to our departments tab this floating menu will come up going under city clerk and ward redistricting and that'll take you to our redistricting website and essentially all of the information that we share tonight both on the presentation um, and on the schedule is on this website the website will be posted in this table in the similar way um, similarly to how our first website or our first uh, hearing was posted as well. And let me answer the second part of that question, which is when will that be posted? Um, there is a time certain, I believe we need to have this on the website by, I anticipate that this will be posted before the end of this week. Hi there, Troy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanna be clear. My understanding is that you don't have an interactive map. So we would have to download the PDF and print that out and draw by hand on, on that map. And then uh, I guess scan that and then send it back to you. Is that the, the, my, is that the correct understanding of the process? The city's map is, yes, a PDF version of the map. So there's probably a number of ways you can have that edited. But yes, we'll, we can accept versions of that map or um, other versions as well. But we do not have an interactive online tool. So I, oh, go ahead. So could we create our own maps using our own GIS, for example? Yes. You can literally draw on a napkin and send it to us. Um, we will accept maps in any form. Um, and I just want people to know that once they do, you know, download the map, um, they can also draw on programs on um, their computer, or if they print it out, they can take a photo of the end product and email it in. Um, so you don't have to scan it if you don't have a scanner, because that can definitely be a barrier. Okay, and then can you confirm that that if we any well if we draw our own lines on the map, they're going to have to align with the census tract. Is that correct? Um, they're going to have to align with the census blocks, which is a smaller um, data source data point. Um, so we can't break data or census blocks, but we can. Um, break uh, census tracts. Could you repeat that last part again, please? Oh, yeah. We cannot break census blocks, which is the smallest unit uh, of data, 
but we can break census tracts. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the difference, a data block uh, or a data tract is a grouping of data blocks. Okay, I, I appreciate that. And, and I would suggest that maybe, you know, on the maps that you include the census blocks map. Absolutely. Okay. And I'll just do another quick check-in again. We are dwindling a little bit in um, attendees. So we will stay on for a couple minutes more to capture if there's anybody else who might join late. Um, but for those who are um, still on with us, if you're uh, listening for the input, that's great. We welcome you. Um, and if also, if you are taking a look at the list of communities of interest we have currently, um, if you think of any, feel free. Now is a great time to share. Um, or else we will still be available to answer questions.
Hi there, we're going to do another check in. Um, we're looking at our attendees list and we do have some fluctuating attendees and um, new ones. So for any of you who have just joined, we have concluded the presentation portion of our uh, online workshop tonight. What we are doing right now is having an open floor for communities of interest feedback. So for anyone who's just joined for your benefits, let me pull up our main presentation. All of this information uh, on tonight's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the city's website. I'll take you on a quick tour of the city's website that is bakersfieldcity.us. So starting from our main page, the quickest way to get over to our redistricting page is going to over to departments. Under the city clerk's department, and then over to our ward redistricting website. Apologies, my internet connection there, but it looks like we're good. This is our ward redistricting website. Some of the things I want to draw attention to to anybody who just joined is the middle of our page where you can see our documents for submitting your community of interest. You can do this by filling out PDFs, emailing them in. We also have an online version of this form. Both of these forms are available both in English and in Spanish. And you can read on a little bit more about what communities of interest are lower down here on the page. And this presentation will be available on this um, page right here. I'm anticipating that we'll have this on the website by the end of the week, both the recording and the presentation itself. Another item I'd like to draw your attention to is our memo on existing 2020 data. So we also went through our current 2020 redistricting data for the city tonight. So if you've joined us and um, you know, you have a network, or maybe you are working in other community organizations and you think that uh, you might know somebody who can submit feedback. What I have up on the presentation is a list of potential communities of interest. It definitely is not totally inclusive, but we do have some guidance to help think about communities of interest. Uh, we did also have some um, participants tonight who uh, provided us with some potential com or with communities of interest. It may also be helpful to note that communities of interest cannot be affiliated with political parties, with incumbents sitting um, public officials or political candidates. And I'll post these photo or I'll post uh, these questions here to kind of help you think about it. If anybody who has joined uh, feels comfortable making a verbal. Uh, or making a verbal comment, you can use the raise hand function and we can unmute you so you can make that. You can also make your testimony uh, by typing it into our question and answer box. Um, and also, of course, you can submit your testimony anytime to our redistricting email.
Hi there. So we're just checking in again. We have not had anyone new join. So we're going to just kind of take a couple minutes here, just in case, and we'll wrap up um, in a few minutes here. We did have um, another question come in, but I think that we will go ahead and um, conclude in just a minute here. All right, everybody, we're going to do just this last check in and close out. So for those of you who are still on, appreciate you staying on for any additional feedback. Please make sure you reach out to me again. This is Brianna Carrier in the city manager's office. Um, I will be overseeing the redistricting email inbox and our redistricting partners consultants will be helping us with our draft maps when the time comes to put those together. So appreciate everybody who's in attendance tonight. Um, Liz, did you have any closing comments? All right, well, thank you again for. Oh, I was just gonna thank everyone who's still on for participating and please do let others know about the process. This will be going on until uh, April. Um, so there will, will be many more opportunities for folks to testify um, and get their opinions in. And I genuinely hope that um, you all look at the maps when they come out and we'd love to hear what you think. Great, thank you. And with that, we're going to go ahead and stop our recording and wish you all a good night. Please make sure that you reach out to your networks and spread the word on redistricting. Have a good night, everybody.